We conduct the study because the heart failure population is a high-risk uh, group of patients, and uh, despite of all the improvements that have been phenomenal in the uh, last year, there, there are still a lot of patients being hospitalized because of heart failure, uh, decompensation, and a lot of patients dying over time uh, with uh, this heart failure condition. We know that um, increased left atrial pressures are the common cause of heart failure decompensation leading to hospitalizations and clinical events in this group of patients. And the hypothesis is that creating an interatrial shunt in order to decompress the left atrium would translate into improved symptoms and a reduced uh, rate of clinical events in uh, this high risk group of patients. This was really the rationale for uh, this study for applying this interatrial shunt technology in this population. Uh, the V-Wave system is an, an interatrial shunt device. It's an hourglass shaped device with a nitinol frame EPT if, uh, e encapsulated. And the device has a minimal diameter of five millimeters with a very small valve sutured inside with three leaflets of uh, porcine pericardium in order to prevent right to left shunting and to ensure the, uh, that the left to right shunt was really unidirectional. This is the device. The device is implanted uh, through a relatively simple procedure, transvenous femoral approach, transeptal puncture. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the procedure has been guided by uh, TEE up to now. And, um, and the device is inserted through a 14 French uh, uh, catheter. And, and usually the procedures take around one hour to, to, to complete the, the procedure. It's not really a very uh, complex procedure. And um, the idea of this uh, first in human feasibility uh, study was to uh, evaluate the safety, feasibility, and exploratory efficacy of uh, this technology in heart failure patients with reduced and preserved ejection fraction. The study design is, is a registry design. It's an observational study, including uh, the first 38 patients that were treated with this device in Canada and, uh, and Europe. The patients included in the study were patients with chronic heart failure that remained in functional class three or ambulatory class four, despite of optimal medical and device uh, therapy. And the main findings are first related to procedural success and safety uh, outcomes, and then the exploratory efficacy. The device was implanted successfully in all patients. There were no cases of device embolization, dislocation, need for a second device meaning that the procedural success rate was 100% in this initial group of patients. Uh, there was only one major uh, complication, uh, periprocedural, related to the device, a cardiac tamponade that was resolved with uh, pericardiosynthesis. And after that, no other major clinical events related to the device, which means that uh, the device could be implanted with a very high successful rate in a, in a very safe manner. In terms of efficacy of the device, the, most of the patients improved the functional status, quality of life, and exercise capacity at three and 12 months uh, follow-up. And there were no significant changes in echocardiographic and hemodynamic variables. This means that the small shunt that was created by uh, the device with a QPQS or in between 1.1 to 1.2 did not translate into uh, any negative effect in terms of right ventricular function or uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension. We also evaluated the, uh, the performance of the device over time through sequential uh, echoes, including uh, TEE exams at one to three months and 12 months. And what we find in this, uh, as I said, uh, first version of the device is that at one year, follow at one to three months, all devices were fully patented. But at one year follow-up, 
about half of them were either stenotic or even uh, occluded, meaning that 50% of them were not fully functional. And what is very interesting is that up to three year follow up, we observed that a much higher rate of events, major events, death, LVAT, heart transplant, heart failure hospitalization occurred among those patients who had a stenotic or occluded chance compared to those patients who uh, had fully patent chance. I think that this, this kind of uh, data was uh, very interesting in terms of uh, potential future studies and showed really that probably this uh, therapy uh, had a real uh, positive uh, effect, not only for symptoms, but all also for uh, major adverse uh, events like death and heart failure hospitalization uh, over time. Thing that what we learned is that uh, the uh, significant proportion of uh, devices uh, were, uh, as I said, stenotic or occluded at uh, 12 months follow up. And uh, we had the opportunity to uh, look uh, exam, uh, exam uh, to do an examination of a shun device that was explanted in a patient who had a heart transplant. Uh, 30 months after the, the procedure, this patient had an stenotic shunt, and the reason for that was uh, 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 panos at the level of the leaflets of the device translating into valve stenosis. This, in addition to the fact that we didn't see any thrombus in any of the cases, makes uh, highly likely that the mechanism for this uh, uh, problem of stenosis occlusion was a really uh, a valve uh, thickening through a panus, and the new generation of the device uh, has taken out the valve. The valve is no more there, and the preclinical studies performed with the, this second generation of the device are uh, very promising, and this is the generation of, that will be used in a pivotal randomized trial that will be launched uh, this year.